very special night. Always a very special night where we have an opportunity to have our good friend Harry Rothenberg on to share some words of wisdom. I just want to say that if you don't like Harry's class tonight, um, it's it's he, I gave him three months to prepare it, so there's really no <laughs> whatsoever for anything other than the, the most perfect class you've ever heard in your life. Uh, the truth is, I gave Harry about about <laughs> well, let's just say a few minutes to prepare it. And there are very few people that I feel like I can do that to, but uh, but Harry's one of them. So I think most of you have had the opportunity to either meet Harry before on one of our uh, amazing trips to Israel. Harry's been our fearless leader on uh, our last several trips to the Holy Land with the Momentum guys. And um, those have been incredible experiences for all of us. And I think some of you who are not on that trip have also had an opportunity to to hear, hear, to hear Harry speak in uh, previous Parsha Unpacked about a, mm, two, three months ago, I'm thinking. Anyway, but for those of you who may not know who Harry is, so Harry Rothenberg is, um, is in addition to being a, a very well-known courtroom lawyer who focuses on um, victims of catastrophic injury, Harry is also a very well sought out international speaker uh, on Jewish topics. He has an incredible passion for Torah, which is why I think people really enjoy listening to him so much. His passion, his excitement for Torah is contagious, and, um, and you will all see what I mean by that in a few minutes. And also, Harry has a very popular weekly video blog on the Parsha that goes out every week, and hopefully, Harry, you'll be able to share with us, well, and if anyone's not doesn't get that weekly email, where they can uh, get that so they can continue to follow you um, you in your Parsha blog. So I want to just say that tonight's class is going to be dedicated to a Rafua uh, Shlema, to a speedy recovery for Avram ben Sarah and Yehudit Ariela Bat Yocheved. May they both have a full and complete and speedy recovery. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Harry. I'm going to mute myself. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity. Um, I just put in the chat the um, subscribe link. Uh, if anybody, if you listen to this and you enjoy it, you want to get the uh, the weekly video. The weekly video is shorter than this one. Uh, it's only uh, we aim to be under five minutes each week. Um, so it's in the chat. I don't want to forget to do that. So I put it in there now. Um, so this is a Parsha class. Uh, the Parsha that we're in is Devarim. Um, and I, oh, I have this long running debate with my rabbi um, because I think that God has a fantastic sense of humor and my rabbi is not comfortable with that. Like, you know, I mean, God's not your buddy. I mean, he's your father in heaven, but I don't know if you could say he has a sense of humor. Um, but I find um, ample opportunities to provide evidence of that. So exhibit A is that it occurred to me this week while preparing for my Parsha video, uh, I realized that I have to speak about Tisha B'Av because Tisha B'Av is Sunday. I typically speak about the holidays when there's a holiday. And I realized, you know, it's a shame I never get, or I rarely get to speak about Parsha's Devarim because it usually falls out this week. And then the next thing you know, I, I no sooner had the thought than I got a message from Rabbi Began saying, hey, sorry for the short notice. Can you pinch it for me? So I said, okay, very cute. That was very cute. So obviously uh, somebody up there um, wanted me to prepare something for, for Devarim. So um, Devarim begins and it gets its name from the first sentence. Um, Devarim means words also can mean things in Hebrew, but here it refers to words. And so the first sentence in, the, in this Parsha and in the book, which is the fifth book uh, of the Torah, Deuteronomy, um, is, starts off with, these are the words that Moses, Moshe spoke to all of Israel. And if you spend the time to go through this week's Parsha and all the ones that follow until we get to the end of the Torah, you'll see that each one of these Parshas, Parshiot, Hebrew, um, is a master class in oral advocacy. Moshe inspires, he critiques, he rebukes, he exhorts with just the right amount of pressure, making people feel bad if they did the wrong thing, but not too bad, making people feel inspired, but not forced. It's, it's unbelievable how exact his words are. He doesn't just, he didn't just inspire the Jews of yesteryear, thousands of years ago, but he continues to inspire year after year, decade after decade, century after century, including us thousands of years later. And so you'll say, well, 
that shouldn't be surprising. I mean, this is, it's Moshe. You know, he's the, he's the greatest man who ever lived. Like, why should that be inspiring or ex- surprising that his words are inspiring? And I'll tell you why it should be extremely inspiring. Because if you go back to the burning bush, we know that he told God, I, I'm not going to imitate it. God forbid I would not, never imitate a stutter. He said to God, I can't do this because I can't speak. I stutter. I'm, I'm clumsy of speech. And God does not say, don't be ridiculous. You speak beautifully. I've heard you before. I was there at your bar mitzvah. God says, okay, we'll appoint your brother, Aaron. Aaron, he'll be your spokesperson. Spokesperson. So it seems like God's agreeing. Yeah, I mean, that's the fact. He does stutter. So this guy who was stuttering, who was clumsy of speech, by the time we get to the end of the Torah, we hear, these are the words that Moshe, not that God, that Moshe spoke to all the Jews and inspiring them, these incredible words like, how that happened? So some of the commentators have a very straightforward answer. They say that it was a miracle, that when we stood, when our ancestors stood at the base of the mountain, at Mount Sinai, before we got the Torah, it was a, like a, I mean, I hate to make the analogy, but it's just the most apt one, like a Baptist revival. Like it was, I can see, I can walk, I can hear. Like there was a miraculous recovery. Anybody who had any type of disability, anybody who was who was lame could walk, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, and the stutterers could speak. And so God just, you know, waved his, his magic wand, like uh, like Harry Potter. I shouldn't make that analogy. He's a lot more powerful. And he cured him. And so that's easy enough. He cured him. But others say, no, he worked on it. He worked on it. He worked on it. He worked on it. And this stutterer, who used to be clumsy of speech, became this incredible orator. By the way, just as an aside, there are those who say that God specifically chose somebody who didn't speak well to be the redeemer because he was worried that if he chose somebody who was a phenomenal orator, people would say, oh, there, come on, that's a figment of his imagination. The reason that the people followed him is because he's very charismatic and that's why they, they followed him. But a guy who can't speak, it's like, well, obviously there must be something more than him. Can't be that he's the, the, the reason. Um, but certainly after um, Harsinai, either because he was mar- miraculously cured or because he worked on it, he turned into a, um, a phenomenal orator. Um, I heard just as an aside, I have to share the story because it's unbelievable. My son, um, who uh, spent the first, one of my sons who spent the first four years or so of marriage studying in Israel, uh, now came back to the States and he's studying in, in Lakewood, um, plans to transition at some point in the next couple of years into the workplace. But as of now, he's still studying in, uh, in, in a kolo, in yeshiva in Israel. And my parents bought a house in Lakewood they moved from Philadelphia. Still, they still spend time in Philadelphia, but they have a house in Lakewood now where they're spending most of their time. And so my son said, you got to hear this story about grandpa. That's my dad. That's how my son refers to him. He says, you know, he moved into this new development in Lakewood. And he's obviously not used to back where he was in Yardley, Pennsylvania. Nobody was going door to door, knocking on people's doors for, for, um, for donations because there weren't that many observant Jews there. But in Lakewood, you know, it's a, it's a mile a minute. There's constant needs. Everybody in the, every organization, he said, so word obviously got out that, hey, some new guy, you know, moved in who's generous, you know, go see him. So it's nonstop. He could, my father, like he lives across the street from the synagogue. He can't, he told me the same thing. He said, he can't walk across the street back and forth without somebody hitting him up, which he, you know, he, he enjoys. Um, he appreciates most of the time. Although in the past, it used to be, he would come to the office and he would have somebody meet them. And it wasn't too often in the house. So this is far more often that he's meeting somebody face to face. So my son tells me that, a guy who's a friend of a friend stopped my father coming out of services and said, oh, uh, Mr. Rothenberg, can I kind of see you for a minute? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm collecting for my, uh, for my coal ale. Could you possibly give us something? And my father couldn't help but notice that the fellow had a, a terrible stutter. So um, you know, very difficult for him to get the words out, but he managed to, you know, uh, to give my father either a card or something. He wrote it down. My father said, sure, I'll have my, you know, my office manager send the check out. And, he, and the guy had written his contact information on this card or whatever he gave him. My father took down his contact information. A day or two later, this fellow who came to collect money gets a phone call from a total stranger saying, hi, um, I got your number from Mr. Rothenberg. Um, I run a program and it helps people, it trains people how not to stutter. Um, and I want to know when you can start. The guy says, well, what do you mean? Like, what, what are you talking about? He says, no, Mr. Rothbard told me that you, 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 might, you, you thought you'd be interested. And I'm telling you, I can, I can hear on the phone, you have a stutter. I can teach you how not to stutter. And the guy said, you know, what does it cost? And he said, don't worry, Mr. Rothenberg took care of it. I said to my son, I was like, you're kidding, right? So in other words, some guy, stranger, 
comes up to my father, asks him for a donation for his organization, stutters, gives his contact information. My father's like, I can take care of this. Find some guy, I don't know how in the world he knew of somebody or asked somebody around who can cure stuttering, paid for the guy's program, and this gets better. Because my son told me this is at the end of the three-month program, the guy no longer stutters. So I have little doubt that uh, when they when, when he gets upstairs, he should live to 120 and the accusing angel starts telling, my, uh, telling God about all the terrible things my father did, the defending angel will have this one in his pocket saying, excuse me for a second, I'd like to, uh, to tell a story. So I just wanted to, I figured it was apropos of how Moshe worked on that. So we can work on it. So Moshe worked on the stuttering according to some commentators. Interestingly, that is not the first time that Moshe worked on something. He had a whole progression and, and the Torah walks us through that progression because this is how he begins his career. We know what happens, right? He was, um, you know, I always like to, to tell over the story. We know what happened when he was a baby. His parents knew that his, that his planet was going to, to, uh, to blow up. They put him in a rocket. They blasted him off. He landed in Jonathan and Martha Kent's backyard. They adopted him. They changed his name from Cal L to Clark. And you're asking me, why am I telling Superman's story and not Moshe's? And the answer is that is Moshe's story when Siegel and Schuster back in the 1930s were looking for a superhero, they just, uh, they, they adapted Moshe's story. Instead, it was the original story is Moshe's parents put him in a basket and he's put in the Nile and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and she adopts him and she renames him. So they just kind of updated the story. And that's how they borrowed the baby Moses story and turned it into the Clark Kent slash Superman story. So the Moses story is he starts in the basket adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the palace. He's 20 years old, according to most of the commentators. And he's the overseer of the palace. And he sees an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Jewish man. And the Torah tells us that he looked this way and that, and he saw no man and he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. One of the commentators says, you know what that means? He looked this way and that, he saw no man. Torah doesn't need to tell us that. Obviously, he would have checked it before he went and killed an Egyptian taskmaster. That's suicidal if somebody's looking. What it means, metaphorically, is that he looked this way and that, and he said to himself, I don't see a man here. I, what am I? Am I Egyptian? Am I, am I Jewish? What am I? I got to make a decision here. And he decided I'm Jewish, and that's what he killed the Egyptian. So that meant that he had gotten involved and showed his sensitivity and showed that he was willing to get involved when it was an Egyptian, a non-Jew, beating a Jew. The next day, it's two Jews arguing. Are you going to stick your nose in there? And the answer is yes, because they're arguing. It's not appropriate. Maybe I can break it up. And he sticks his nose in, tries to break it up. What does he get for his trouble? It's Dustin and Aviram who are going to become his rivals for the, the rest of their lives until the earth literally swallows them alive. And they say, who are you? Who, who made you a master over us? They report on him to Pharaoh. He almost gets killed. He has to flee as a fugitive to Midian. When he gets to, and now he's passed the second test, Jew versus Jew, got involved. When he gets to Midian, the shepherds are harassing the daughters of um, Yisrael, his future father-in-law. And now he's got a question, am I going to get involved? Now it's non-Jew versus non-Jew. Maybe I can sit this one out. And no, he gets involved and he saves them from the shepherds and he passes that test. His next test is that after he marries one of Yisrael's daughters, he becomes Yisrael's shepherd. And we're told that he took Yisro's sheep out to graze way out in the, in the, in the, in the boonies, in the, in the hinterland. Why? The commentators explain that he was very careful because he did not want the sheep that he was watching to graze and eat the grass or food of anyone else. So he would specifically take them out to unowned land, to, to, to pasture land not owned by anybody, because he was worried, because now he's showing, not only am I worried when it's a non-Jew beating a Jew, not only am I worried when it's a Jew versus a Jew. Not only am I worried when it's non-Jew versus non-Jew. Not only am I worried, I'm, I'm also worried about the property of a non-Jew. And the last test was that one of the sheep, the measure explains this beautifully, gets ill. And he goes over and, and, and finds it and realizes that he can't keep up with the rest of the flock. And he picks it up and he puts it on his shoulders. And he's, and he's carrying that sheep back with him with the rest of the flock. And that's when up in heaven, God says, that's the guy that I want to be the shepherd of my flock. And that's when he appears to him at the burning bush, which is another test, because most of us, if we were passing by the burning bush, might well have said to ourselves, don't look. Whatever you do, do not look that way, because there's a bush on fire and it's not being consumed. You know what that means? It could be God. 
And if it's God, he might start telling me to do things or worse, not to do things. Just keep walking. You didn't see anything. And instead, Moshe says, I have to turn and investigate. What is this great sight? And that's when he gets the tap on the shoulder from God telling him, you the man, you have to lead. But he's not done. I, I, it pains me to tell this over. I do not have broad enough shoulders to tell it over on my own, but I heard it from a very, very well-respected rabbi. So I, I feel like I can tell it over um, with apologies to Moshe. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm optimistic that because the rabbi told it, because it's an opportunity for us to learn, um, that it's okay. But I still tell it over with some trepidation. So the last argument that Moshe has at the burning bush, after seven days, we're not told this in the text, but the rabbis tell us this was seven days they were arguing. I'm clumsy of speech. I'll get you a, a spokesperson. They're not going to believe me. I'll give you signs. The last thing Moshe says is, God, not me, send whom you'll send, which the commentators explain means he was saying, send my older brother, Aaron, send Aaron. And God says to him, don't worry. Aaron's coming to greet you and he's happy to see you. And that's when Moshe agrees. Now, the beautiful part of this, some say, is that Moshe was saying to God, I'm so worried that I might insult my brother because he's been the leader of the Jews for the last 60 years. And if I come and displace him, he might be upset about that. And so Moshe was even willing to delay the redemption lest he take the chance of insulting his brother. But others say the following. God was saying back to Moshe, and God got angry when he answered him. God, it's this, the one time they've been arguing for a week. It's the first time God gets angry and tells him, you know, Aaron's coming and he's going to be happy and you have to go. So there's a debate that the commentators record between two rabbis. One says every single other place in the Torah where it says that God got angry, there's some type of consequence or punishment, except for here. And the other one says, no, you're wrong. There is a consequence here. You know what happened here? Moshe was supposed to, in addition to being the leader of the Jews, he was supposed to also be the high priest, the Kohen Gadol. And he lost it here and it went to Aro. Why? So this rabbi explained as follows. God was saying to Moshe the following. You're worried because you think Aaron's going to be upset when he gets the news that I appointed you as the leader? You obviously don't know your older brother. Your older brother understands that everything we do is, is for God at his command, and he knows what's best. And he'll understand fully that if I chose you, it's you. He's not for a second going to feel bad about that. So why would you think that Aaron would feel bad? You know why? It must be. Because if you were in his shoes, you'd feel bad. You're self-projecting. You got some ego there. You're saying to yourself, you know, if I was there and I was the leader, my whippersnapper younger brother came and you know took over for me, I'd be upset. Wrong. Aaron doesn't feel that way. You must be feeling that way. That's a problem. You know why? Because there's no I in Kohen. You cannot be thinking about yourself. The Kohen, the priest, let alone the high priest, has to always be outer directed, always thinking about others. You're thinking about yourself. That's why you thought your self-projection that Aaron would be upset. You can't be the Kohen Gadol. And so he loses it because there's still too much I in him. And so he had to work on his humility, work and work and work. This is Moshe at the burning bush, according to this explanation, still had work to do. He was not yet the person who he would later become. The person that the Torah is later going to tell us is the Anav. Mikol Adam, the most humble person who ever lived, not there yet. Even he had work to do. It was a process. It was a progression. So if I could quote the, the I'm from Philadelphia, so I like to quote the, uh, the, the great Rocky Balboa. We all remember his impassioned speech, Rocky IV, right? Um, if I can change, and then there's the translator, then you can change. Everybody can change. And then the whole, you know, uh, whatever, the KGB and company, they all start, start cheering. But that's what we believe. I saw an interview once. They were, um, there was a couple of talking heads were talking about a, a, a notorious, not very well-liked owner of a sports franchise. And they were saying, you know, you're in your teens, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, you can still change. But when you're in your 40s and your 50s, by then, you are who you are. You can no longer change. And we disagree with that about as emphatically as anybody can disagree with anything. We say, no, you are never who you are until the day of your death. You get credit for growth every single day. The Talmud has a whole expansive discussion 
of people who gained heaven in an instant. They talk about one of the, we're going to read about this, unfortunately, on Tisha, about one of the many gut-wrenching things we read. The Romans, one of the, the 10 martyrs that they killed, the, the, they, had, they had wrapped him in, in tufts of wool and set it on fire. And the reason they wrapped him that way is that it would last longer. In other words, to, it wasn't enough to burn him alive. They had to slowly burn him alive, so it would be even more torture. And the executioner, the Roman executioner watching him said, look, if I, if I take that off so that you'll die quicker, you know, will I go to heaven? He said, yes. And he took it off and then like plunged in himself and was also burnt. Um, and then like a voice said, you know, he, both of them, the, the rabbi and this fellow, the executioner, have been accepted to heaven. So last day of his life, it's not over. You know, we all, the old phrase, it ain't over until it's over. Or to, um, for those of you who remember this, to paraphrase the late, great John Belushi, you know, over? Did you say over? Nothing is over until you decide it is. It's not over. It's not over um, until we get to the until we get to the end. And that's interesting. That's why um, we in the outside world we celebrate birthdays. You know, very famously, we'll know when somebody was born. It's it's uh, President's Day because of the birthdays. It's Martin Luther King Day because of a birthday. Um, you know, we'll celebrate birthdays in Judaism. We do not celebrate birthdays. You know why? Because you didn't do anything yet. When you came into this world, you know, with, you, with your hands all clenched, clenched, like Daffy Duck, mine, 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 you know, nobody else's, I'm going to grab everything. It's the day you leave when you, when you let go, that's when we can see what effect that you had uh, on the world and on your loved ones and people you, you influenced. And so that's why we celebrate your sites. That's an important day. Um, there are days when we change the prayer service. There are days when we, when we, when we might, you know, certain sects, like the Hasidic sect, are more careful about this. And there are more days that they'll do this on. But there are days where we won't say a certain prayer because it's the yurt site of someone who was a, you know, who was a great person. It's the day they died, not the, not the day that they were, not the day they were, they, they were born. Um, life is a journey. It's a journey that is best made through small steps. There's a very interesting, my rabbi, um, my rebbe, Rabbi Malevsky. Um, Zatzal, Zechert Tzadik Lavrach, as we say, um, he used to explain the following, quoting a, a commentator. He said it beautifully that the were, the altar in the temple um, had a ramp. The Kohanim would 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 ascend the ramp, and it was very specific that it had to be a ramp and not steps. So there, the the reason, the typical reason given that the commentators explain is that on if on, if one was on steps, then you have to lift your your feet. When you lift your feet. You know, it's not that somebody would do this, but it's sort of like, you know, underneath the, the, the Cohen's garment, it's like exposing his, you know, under underneath him, his private parts. And so that is considered disrespectful. And so therefore we would, would build a ramp so that he wouldn't have to take steps such that he would be disrespecting the, the surface below. And of course, the lesson we learn from that is that if you have to be careful about disrespecting stairs, how careful you have to be about disrespecting your, your fellow human beings. But the other reason that my rabbi used to explain is that if you build stairs, then when you ascend them, you have to lift your feet a certain amount. This is you, this is going to sound comical. You you can Google this. I got a big kick out of this when I when I learned this. Um, I'm a personal injury attorney, as you heard. So I represent people who get injured in accidents. Years ago, we had a case where a, a woman fell down a flight of stairs at a very very high end venue in Manhattan, had a horrific injury, and we said we'll investigate the case. We'll see if there's any liability. And we're looking at the stairs, and usually when you're going to take a, 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 a pedestrian fall down case as a lawyer, you want the picture, you see the picture, to look at it and say, oh my goodness, right? There's a missing banister, there are cracks, the, the stairs are crumbling, like something you're like, how could somebody let it go like this? And here we looked at the stairs like, that happens to be one of the nicer staircases I've ever seen. Like, how could this possibly be a case? We said the injury is serious enough, we'll send down an expert. So we send an expert down, it's a public venue. And he did some measurements. I came back and said, you absolutely have a case. I said, well, how am I going to explain this to a jury? He said, I'm going to tell you, Blondell's theorem. I said, I'm sorry, you, you, what is that? And he explained that there is an actual mathematical computation. I can never remember whether it's twice the riser plus the tread or twice the tread plus the riser. And it's got to be between like, I don't know, like I forget what the, the numbers were, like between 15 and a half and 17 and a half inches. And if it's not, it's dangerous. Because, the, because if you have a, 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 a behavioral dynamics or, or uh, expert, they will show you um, that, if, that if, that, if that geometry is not correct, it leads to a tripping hazard. So steps are very specific. Each step you must, if it's a four inch step, a five inch step, a six inch step, you have to take that amount in step. Or if you take two steps, you'd still need to find them out. 
So we build the altar with a ramp to teach us that we have to grow at our own pace. Has to be at our own pace. There cannot be a predetermined. Nobody should be telling you, okay, this is it. This is your regimen. This is your program. There's no, I, for a diet, that's great. For other programs, that's great. But when it comes to spiritual growth, it's got to be at your own pace. And it should be at a, at a slow measured pace. If it's steps, you got to, each step, you got to lift up that foot and make it to the next step, right? But if it's a ramp, you can kind of shuffle your feet. You can go really, really slowly. You don't have to even take a step. You can take a little shuffle and that's better than you were before. And if you slide back, you, you slide forward again. So the, um, it's, it's, it's another rabbi likes to say, um, Rabbi Wine, that if you're the same person at 50 that you were at 40, that's tragic because you lost 10 years. And if you're the same person at 70 that you were at 30, you lost 40 years. And so we want to see growth. It can be, it should be incremental. I always tell people, like, don't take on something enormous. Take on something small. Um, I, I had an experience recently, a, 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 um, a horrible experience in Mayrone. We all know what happened in Mayrone. And now we've got Surfside that we're dealing with. But in Mayrone, um, 45 people were killed on Lagba Omer, um, one of the holiest days of the year, one of the holiest spots uh, on earth. And one of the people killed was um, my daughter-in-law's younger brother, 13-year-old brother. Um, sweetest, nicest, you know, little angelic kid, um, uh, incredible um, young man, and he was taken away in, 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 in just in, in circumstances that we can't cannot wrap our minds around. And so my um, my machatenister, my daughter in law's mother, um, asked people to, in his honor, in his memory, to take on something small. And it was very interesting when I received her request because I was thinking I said to my wife, we need to take on something big. But the reason she said to take on something small is that if you take on something big, it's great if it works, but usually it doesn't. It just doesn't. You know, we, we have these wonderful comes Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we're going to save the world and change our lives. And it usually doesn't happen. It doesn't work. But taking on something small, small, there's a much bigger guarantee um, that it will uh, that it will happen. And so I did. Um, I can tell you what it is. I, I hope to also take on something big. What I decided to do since then, and I'm still going, thank God, is to before I go to sleep at night to learn one extra halacha, one extra Jewish law um, every night. So that's something I figured it's something that I can take on and hopefully will continue and so far so good. So we can take on small things. And then once you incorporate that into your repertoire, into your resume, into your daily routine, you can take on something else small. And then we can also at times take on, take on bigger things. So what's interesting is that, as I said, Moshe grows up to become the un of Mikol Adam, that's God's description, it's the Torah's description of him, the most humble among all of mankind. But think about that for a second. He started off as the palace overseer. When you're the palace overseer in my mind's eye, what that means is that your chariot is made by Ferrari. Your bedroom is like the Four Seasons, Cairo, maybe not the presidential suite, but whenever, you know, because that's the king's, or maybe it was the presidential suite because the king's got his palace. I mean, he's the overseer in the palace at 20 years old. That's not the guy you would think is going to become the most humble man who ever lived. And yet he did. And so it's, it's, what's so interesting is when you compare that to the um, career arc of another very well-known character in the Torah, it, it proves this point, I think, in a beautiful way. Um, King David, uh, when he was a kid, um, had a very, very... Uh, tricky, let's call it tricky, upbringing with a tricky, I'm saying tricky, I could use other words, uh, let's say maybe strained relationship with his family. Um, what had happened was, I'll explain this briefly. If you have questions, you'll tell Rabbi Began, he'll say, oh, thanks, Harry. Thanks for leaving me with that one. This is very difficult to, to, to explain or understand this story, but I'll tell it to you because I don't shy away from, from things. I think that the, that, that, that the, the Torah includes everything that's, that happened. It doesn't shy away from stories that are uncomfortable. So what happened was that um, King David's father, Yishai, Jesse, somehow knew prophetically that he was going to be the, the father of the king or the, the progenitor of the, of, the, of the kingly line, the regal line, the messianic line. And he always had a worry. Why? Because he knew that he was a direct descendant from Rus, Ruth the Moabite, who was a convert. The Torah tells us that a Moabite convert cannot marry into the Jewish people, but a prior court rabbis had said, 
that only refers to male, not female. You can marry if you're a female convert from Moab. But he was worried. Maybe a later court is going to override that. So he had already had seven sons. And he decided what he was going to do was separate from his wife um, and then take on his, his uh, in an act of intimacy, his maidservant. And then if she would become, if she would conceive, he could free her and that baby would be born and would still be his descendant, but wouldn't be tainted from the Moabite line because of the complicated laws involving a child with a, had with a, with a, with a maidservant. The maidservant ran to his wife, told her about this plan, conspired with the wife. And so the, on the appointed night, they switched places, which should remind you of what happened with, uh, with Jacob, with Yaakov and, and, uh, and Rachel and Leah when, they're, when, her, when their father switched their places. And so they switched places. He was with his wife, thinking he was with the maidservant. His wife got pregnant. Obviously, that was very awkward. Who's the father? He had separated from her. This young kid is born. He's not sure who the father is. She knows who the father is. And so David was not in the house growing up. They were the nuclear family was in the house. He was out in some other place, like watching the sheep, wasn't in the house, such that when God told the Navi, Samuel, Shmuel, to go appoint the next leader of the Jewish people, he comes to the house and he um, tells Yeshai, I'm here to appoint the next leader, the next king of the Jews. And Yeshai, this is it. This is the prophecy, right? So he calls in his first son, who is, you know, has a regal bearing, and he's a brilliant and good looking and tall, and he's a warrior, all the, all of the, the, uh, he's got everything going for him. And God whispers in Shmuel's ear, don't be deceived by appearances, it's not him. And he says to Yishai, it's not him. It's not my firstborn, it's not my before. Okay, let's go. Boy chick number two. He brings in a second son, and God whispers, same thing, I know he looks the part, it's not him and three, and four, and five, and each one of them walks in. It's like this, obviously, he's going to be the next king. Not him, not him, not him. Number six, not him. Number seven, not him. And Shmuel says to Yishai, you can't wrap your mind around this scene. He says to Yishai, do you have another son? And Yishai says back to Shmuel, no. And Shmuel says back to Yishai, God sent me to this house. I got it right here on my GPS or whatever they used back then, my map. I'm in the right house. God told me to go to the house of Yishai and anoint the next king of Israel. So I'm asking you again, do you have another son? And Yishai starts stammering and says, um, there's the shepherd out in the back. Bring him in. And they go get the shepherd. Can you imagine what, what, what David looked like walking in as the, as the shepherd? Imagine what he smelled like. Forget what he looked like. He walks into the room. This guy is not in the house. He's out in the whatever, in the, in the servant's quarters, the, the shepherd's hut, walks into the house, and the oil in the anointing flask starts bubbling over. And Shmuel says, all rise for the next king of Israel. And he anoints David to the shock of everyone else in the family. Absolute shock. So David later says, Evan Masu Habanan, the stone that was scorned by the others, Hoysa Rosh Pina became the cornerstone. Now, if I asked you, if I said to you, look, I know you're not a psychiatrist, although maybe there is a psychiatrist in the audience, but let's be armchair psychologist just for the evening. I'm going to give you a psychological profile. You got a guy and it's unclear who his father is. And he's got, he's living with a family, but he's not, doesn't have a seat at the table. He's out watching the, the sheep in the, in the shepherd's hut. Okay. And the elders are all being groomed to be the leaders of the, you know, of their people. You know, what do you think? How do you think that guy's going to fare in, with respect to his mental health? And you're probably going to say, mm, I think he might need some time on the couch, you know, with a, with a therapist. And instead, this guy from the humblest of beginnings, how do we know him? King David. The guy who started with the humblest beginnings, King David. The other way around, the guy who started as the palace overseer becomes the most humble man alive because they both worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. Now, when we talk about, so it's not, so again, it's not where you start, it's where you end up. When we talk about Moshe's humility, we have to be careful because we might make the mistake of thinking that Moshe was a big wimp. He was, I don't know, you know, Casper Milk Toast. Like he was the, you know, you say he was the most humble man alive, humble and, and unassuming 
and and quiet. Oh, Mo, you were you here the whole time. I, I, I didn't even know. And there are only three people in the room. I didn't hear from you like that. You know, the whole time, we all know people who are very quiet, very shy, and very reserved, and very humble. I mean, you go go look at the at his exploits in the Torah. Does he strike you as somebody who was a, a shrinking violent? I mean, every single time we just went through all the different things he did and killing the Egyptian, getting involved in the fight between the Jews, getting involved in the fight between the, the non-Jews and the and worrying. And, and every time there's something that he, he, if he had to do something with respect to, to giving it to the people, gave it to them. Taking on God at the golden calf, God says, that's it. I'm going to wipe them all out. Leave me alone. Leave you alone? Oh, I'm not leaving you alone. Let's go right now, big guy. We're going to have a conversation. And he convinces God to save the Jewish people. And so this is not somebody who shies away ever. That's not what, what we're talking about with humility. Humility, the best way I can, I can try to describe, describe it is as follows. You've got a fly and a fly is sitting on the windshield of your car. And next to that fly, it's a big fly, one of those horse flies. I mean, it's like humongous. It's like, is that a cockroach or a fly? It's a fly, just a really big fly. And next to that fly is like a little flea that you can barely see it. And the big fly says to the little flea, like, hey, what's up there, little guy? When you flick the switch on your windshield, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, I'm not advocating killing flies unnecessarily. But if you do, it starts raining and you flick the switch on your windshield, they're both getting blasted to kingdom come. Like what's the, the difference between the two becomes inconsequential. So when you're Moshe and you're closer than anyone ever has been to God, you realize the distance between us and God more than anybody. So you realize the distance between me and any other person, even if he is the most, if he's the smartest and strongest and bravest and most charismatic compared to the least brave, good looking, tall, charismatic, whatever qualities, wealthy, it's irrelevant because compared to God, it's the difference between the flea and the fly compared to the, the windshield. It's inconsequential. So that was his level of humility. In addition, he realized that everything came from God. It all came from God. There's a very interesting blessing we make every time before we eat bread. We say to God, we bless him, and we say, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz, who makes bread come from the ground. Hamotzi, who brings up lechem, bread, min from ha'aretz, the ground. The last time I checked, Bread doesn't grow from the ground. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Maybe in Chicago it does. I don't think so. It, you have wheat that grows from the ground, and you have wheat, and you have water, you have flour, you have you know whatever else you put in some eggs, and you put in some sugar. You, you put you mix in all these ingredients. I don't know. I'm not usually using my wife kicks me out of the kitchen. My daughters do if they're making kala, and and they make and they turn it into bread. Bread doesn't grow in the ground. So what kind of wacky blessing is that? Like maybe say who makes the grain come from the earth or who blesses us with bread, you know, meaning that bread is a metaphor for, you know, bread, like for, for money. He, he makes bread come from the ground. And the answer is we're reminding ourselves that every single thing that went into getting that bread from the ground onto our table, it all came from him. So for Moshe, it, there was, there was no pride to be taken. Hey, you know, I was thinking I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty good dad. I was, that was a pretty good speech that I gave to those, to those Jews tonight. I think I crushed that. Hey, honey, did you hear that speech? That was, that was a pretty good speech, right? Every talent, all the talents that he was given, it came from God. And he understood that. There was never, so there wasn't any, like, like the, the satisfaction maybe was in using them the right way. That's something you can give yourself a pat on the back for, but not for having the, the resources themselves. Um, that my, my, um, my, one of my favorite stories, which I think is one of the most important stories for anyone who ever speaks in public to hear, is back in Tzfat, um, this is going back hundreds of years, there was a short period of time, there was an unbelievable collection of Jewish talent, some of the most talented people concentrated in one small area that we've ever had in history. And the, the, um, the Rav Moshe Cordovero was there, and the, um, the, um, uh, the Alshech was there, and the, um, the Alkabets, there were all sorts of, of different um, people. And Rav the Alshech was the darshan. He was the speaker. He was the great public speaker um, and writer. And but towering above them all was the Ariza, the the Makubo, the Kabbalist. And so the Alshech was um, was doing his, uh, I believe, his Shabbos Agado, the Shabbos before Passover, 
um, is one of the, the times of the year when the rabbi really, really puts in time. And this is their, their big talk of the year. And so he was delivering his Shabbos Agado Drasha, his big sermon. And the Arizal was in the room. And he noticed sometime during the talk that the Arizal got up and left the shul. And it was like, a, you know, jarring. Um, and he finished his talk. And then he spent the next couple of weeks going over every one of his notes and every one of his sources. I don't know if he had notes, but he went over all the sources, everything he had said from beginning to end, A to Z. And he went to see the Arizo. And he said, Rebbe, I reviewed everything. I can't figure out what was, what was my mistake. And the Arizo said, well, what are you talking about? He said, obviously I made a mistake because Rebbe got up and he walked out of the room. He said, no, chas v'shalom. Your, your drusha was, was beautiful. It was perfect. You didn't make any mistake. He said, well, then why did Rebbe walk out of the room? And the Ariza said to the al I walked out of the room because I was watching you while you were giving the speech. And I saw from your face, I could tell that you were happy that it was you that was giving that great speech. You hear the point he's trying to make? Meaning that, that if you have, the, have, have some great talent, whatever it is, speaking, writing, reading, teaching, you know, athletics, you know, we just had a big milestone, not one, but two, Observant Jews were just drafted in the Major League Baseball draft, right? So whether you can hit a baseball, throw a baseball, um, finance, real estate, whatever your talent is, you have to constantly remind yourself, I'm, I, I'm, I, can, I can take pride in the hard work that I put in. But that talent itself, it comes from God. And contrast that with what's been going on the last few days, the, if you're watching this, the, the spitting contest between Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos. Bezos announced he's going to be the first billionaire in space. And Branson beats him. How about that? <laughs> I was the first billionaire in space. And then Bezos has his company tweet out, no, you weren't, because you only went 80 kilometers up in the air. And that's the U.S. definition of space. I'm going to go 100 kilometers in the air. And that's the whole world definition of space. So I'm really going to be the first billionaire in space. You know, we, 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 we believe that we know that showing off really rankles people, it upsets people. That's why last time I checked, there's something like 150,000 people signed a petition that Bezos should stay in space. I mean, that's telling you something, right? Because like, stop it, it's, it's enough, okay? You're a billionaire, you're a trillionaire, whatever. I don't know what he's up to, okay? But you don't have to rub it in people's faces. Um, we believe in, in, in Ayanhara. Ayanhara literally, literally means evil eye. Um, there are different renditions of this, you know, those who really, really believe um, in certain, certain, uh, you know, pockets of, of Judaism, like that somebody can, can literally like, you know, uh oh, they're giving me the stink eye, I better be careful, you know, quick duck. Um, but, uh, but a more commonly accepted explanation is that if you flaunt your belongings, whether that means wealth or, or children or, or other, or other gifts, um, and people start getting jealous about it, it can cause like a, a reappraisal in heaven of your fitness for those gifts. To be very, very careful, careful not to flaunt them. Um, I have um, become far more sensitive to this over the years, um, and I try. If I'm speaking to somebody who's, you know, like imagine this. So I won't use just use, use any of us as an example. I don't have to use myself as an example. Imagine complaining about your spouse to a single friend who's been looking for a while for a spouse. Imagine complaining about your kids to a single friend or to a childless couple. The the that couple would, would give anything to have the problem you're complaining about. You gotta be sensitive um, to that. You be very, very careful um, not, to, not to, to create that ayanhara by bragging about or flaunting or even talking about our gifts with someone who, who, who is not similarly um, blessed. So we've, we've talked about um, the fact that uh, Moshe, according to some, really worked on getting over his stutter. We talked about his career, that it was a lot of hard work, that whole process into the different tests. We talked about the fact that he was still not a finished product at the bush, that according to some, that's when he lost the opportunity to become the Kohen Goldo because maybe there still is a little bit of I and there can't be any I in Kohen. Um, we talked about the fact that he worked on his humility um, until he became the most humble person uh, who ever lived. Uh, and that's how he was known, notwithstanding his, his far more uh, significant uh, um, beginnings as the overseer in the palace. We contrasted that with King David, who was from incredibly humble beginnings and who went on to become King David. That's how we know him, um, David and um, We talked about how Moshe's humility did not mean being a wimp. You can be absolutely well aware 
of your qualities, your attributes and talents, and, and be also aware of your, of your concomitant obligation to use them the right way. Um, we talked about the, um, the Alshech, how, how you, you, you can be, you can feel, feel, um, good about a job well done. We have to be very careful about basking in your resources, just as resources and not, you know, real, not thanking, uh, God that you're, that you're, you're like, a you know, you're his, you're, you're, you're just wanted to be a, like a funnel, just like through me, God, let it flow through me and let it, let it impact the world. We contrasted Branson and, and Bezos, the battle of the, um, the billionaires talked about how showing off rankles people um, and that we believe in iron heart and we have to be very careful about that. So if we're going to improve, um, we talked about how the best way to do that is to walk up a ramp by taking small steps. Sometimes you can take a bigger one, sometimes a smaller one. Sometimes it could be a stutter step or a shuffle or a half step, and that's fine. We just always want to be moving. Um, we should remind ourselves, I'll mention this now, that if you stand still, life is not a ramp. It's a down escalator. So if you stand still, you tend to slide down. So that's also why we have to be you know, constantly moving. So what I want to finish with is a, is a practical suggestion. And I want to um, base this on that, that request that I, that I pointed out that my uh, there, my, my daughter-in-law's mother uh, made, because the people take on small things. So, and I'll, and I'll, and I will, um, I will use myself as an example here and I'll be specific. Um, so, uh, after I decided to take on something small, um, in honor of my daughter-in-law's younger brother, when I started learning an extra law every night, I did a, um, a cure of trip, a retreat, uh, for a few days. And at the end, um, the, the, I did it with, uh, with two other momentum speakers, one, your local Ari Shabbat, if you haven't had a chance to hear him, you should, uh, and Charlie Harari. And at the end, Charlie suggested to the guys, why don't we all take something on for 40 days? 40 is a time of change, um, like the flood, like, like, um, um, formation of the embryo, like God, Moses going up on the mound for 40 days, pick something. You can think about something that we talked about on this trip. Um, we talked about Moda'ani, we talked about Shema, it could be something family related, spiritual, physical, pick something and do it for 40 days. So during one of the talks at this retreat, um, Ari Shabbat had talked about his journey um, from being out of shape to becoming a Spartan warrior. He participates in, in a lot of these um, Spartan obstacle races and has gotten himself in far better shape than he was in previously. And I said to myself, I got to get in shape. I got to get in shape. Like every time he would speak, I'd feel, you know, you know, worse and worse about myself. Um, because it's just, I just have too much going on and, and, uh, and I don't get enough exercise. And so Ari, during one of his talks mentioned that the, the people think, you know, eating a bowl of cereal, that's pretty healthy. He says, the worst thing you can do when you wake up in the morning, it's a carb bomb. So I decided I got to take something on because it's going to look terrible if one of the trip leaders doesn't take something on. We're asking the, the, the guys, the participants to take things on and we don't have to say what we're doing. So I decided myself, I'm going to take, going to take on 40 days, no cereal in the morning. Okay, not the easiest thing because I eat cereal every single morning except on Shabbos, six days a week. But we had said Shabbos doesn't count because it's a different schedule. And so that's what I took on. About three or four days in, my wife was on to me. She's like, what's up with the eggs every day now? Okay, um, so I had to fess up that that's what I had done. And as we got towards the end, I was happy that I had taken that on. But I just felt that maybe I could have done something that would have more, more wide ranging effect on my life than not to eat a bowl of cereal in the morning. So what I decided was the following. I have been asking for a number of years now, uh, the following, I've been asking the, for, the, for a number of years, the following question, um, when I'm out on the road, I can do it here, but it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's trickier. Um, so I'll just tell it to you how it usually goes, is I ask people, who rules your life? And please be honest with me. And I get great answers. People say to me, my wife, my husband, if it's a younger crowd, my mother, my father, my boss, then we have the very religious people in the crowd and they'll say, you know, God rules my life. Some people say my boyfriend, my girlfriend. Some people say the stock market, um, you know, there are funnier answers. And finally, when I get every possible wrong answer, I say, can somebody, anybody, please be honest with me and tell me who rules your life? And it's like, what's he talking about? And I say, listen, we all, listen, we all know. When there's a newborn baby, um, it could be the father, but I think it's more often the mother. I know from you know from from years back um, when when it was uh, when it was us. If a baby would start crying, it, it could be it could be I don't know how many rooms away. And, you know, boom, instantaneously. My wife said, "Was that the baby?" And of course, that's the baby, right? So we have the same thing, every one of us. Because when this fellow, my phone, 
starts ringing. It's like, what is it? What is it, my baby? Is it is it a WhatsApp? Is it a tweet? Is it an, is it an email? Is it Slack? Is it Messenger? Facebook? Okay, it rules our lives. I'm thankful that one day a week, or in the holidays sometimes, it can be two days or three days a week, one day a week, I get to take control again of my life because it doesn't control my life. So I decided when I got up to about 37 or 38 of my days of no cereal, I got to stop playing around. I got to take on something that's that's more significant. And so what I did was, as of now, tonight I think is going to be night number five, I decided I'm no longer going to take my phone into my bed. So I got an alarm clock, came home and announced to my wife, I hope you're ready for this enormous change in my life. And I took this alarm clock out of the B&H photo video bag. She's like, um, yeah, that looks pretty dramatic. You got an alarm clock. She starts laughing. And I told her what my plan was. And she said, no, you're not really going. To. I said, yeah, from now on, I'm going to set the alarm and I'm going to plug in my phone across the room. So I can't even reach it from my bed. And I'm going to get, I'm going to say my, I'm going to learn my last halacha, last law. I'm going to say my bedtime shema outside my bed. I'm going to plug the phone in across the room. I'm going to set that, the alarm clock's going to sit and I am getting into bed without the phone. And so that means that instead of first doing the last law and then saying my bedtime shema in bed and then watching the Phillies highlights, I'm from Philly. And then, you know, whoever else is still playing, Sixers got eliminated in tragic fashion, but the Sixers or the Flyers or if later in the, the Eagles. And then, hey, maybe there's some other highlights to watch. Then I'm going to go on my news feed and then I'm going to go on Facebook or whatever. Okay. And the next thing you know, it's an hour later. And then I'm going to wake up in the morning using my alarm clock on my phone, grab my phone. Oh, I got to Let's see what WhatsApps did I get overnight from Israel, from London, from friends and wherever in Timbuktu. And, and then I'm going to, you know, see maybe there's a late game. Maybe the, the Phillies played late and they didn't finish yet. And maybe something happened overnight in the, in the sports world. The next thing I know, I'm showing up to prayers and I'm 10 minutes late. And so I, I thankful now, and like I said, I think tonight will be the fifth night. The first night that I did it, when I got into bed, I said to my wife, what do I do now? And she said, you go to sleep. And I said, ah, my hands are shit. Like, do you, do you, I, I feel like, like, do you have any methadone? This must be like what heroin addicts do. Like, I, I think I'm in withdrawals. She's like, just, just go to sleep. And it took a little while, but I fell asleep. And thank God, day by day, um, I can't say it's easy. It's extremely difficult, um, but step by step. I would not say that that was a small one. For me, that was a big one. And I'm thinking that maybe first having taken on a small one and done it, maybe that gave me the, the, the ability to ratchet it up a little bit so I could take on a, a slightly bigger one. So thanks for listening. Um, I am happy to stick around a little bit if people have uh, any questions. Um, if you can, whoever is monitoring, if you could take people off of... Uh, you know, and unmute, I'm happy to uh, happy to answer questions. And thanks for listening. It's nice to see everybody. Any thank questions? You, thank you so much, Harry. Um, I think okay. you have to unmute yourselves because uh, we don't have that control anymore. So unmute yourself and ask some questions. But I do have an announcement to make. Um, next week on Sunday, actually this coming Sunday, um, Rabbi David is switching from Tuesday night to um, Sunday morning. So on the 25th, I'm sorry, so it's a week from Sunday. So on the 25th, Parsha and Pack will be on Sunday morning at, I believe, 10 o'clock instead of Tuesday, the 27th in the evening. That'll be the first day we switch. So you might want to change that in your calendars. So, so Harry, this is Dan. Yeah. Um, hey, Dan. So you've been doing this, like, no, like, phone across the room for five days i think it was so let's see it was i think i started it um last wednesday night so when so wednesday night thursday night saturday night sunday night no i started thursday night so thursday night saturday night sunday night monday night so i guess this will be my sixth night yeah and so first night you had the shakes yep for sure like legitimate shakes <laughs> like great. and now and so you've had a you've had a shabbat yep and that, you know, that's kind of a continuation of that. Right. And now it's Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. What's like, what have you, how, how is, how is it going? So um, I, the, the amazing thing about it is that I don't feel like I don't go through my day like, oh, oh it's just, I don't know how I'm going to get through my day. Mm -hmm. It's just basically, I just, I'm wasting less time. I'm getting more sleep. It's great. It feels great. I, I, I just hope I can do it. Meaning it was, it, it is, it's incredibly addictive. 
what we're doing is we're, we're fooling ourselves because we're mm-hmm. taking a device that builds itself as a productivity device. It's not. It was mm-hmm. made as an entertainment device. Yes, it can be used for productivity, but at the end of the day, it was originally made, what Steve Jobs had in mind was entertainment, not productivity. And so you take a device that's made for entertainment, stick in your pocket and try to be productive with it. It's it, You're fighting a, a losing battle and it's an uphill battle, I should say. I don't want to say losing, but it's an uphill battle. Have you thought about reading now that, so like maybe instead of, um, instead of like not doing a phone thing, picking up like a book? So the, the answer to that is that my wife more often than not um, will turn off the lights earlier. And so I don't like to keep her up. Um, and I'm so tired by the end of the day that if I pick up a book, I'd probably fall asleep right away for some reason, mm. that pesky little addictive device and the light tends to keep you up. I mm. should say, by the way, that one of the reasons why it's so much, why, why I, I find it easier to do this is that I have this unbelievable role model. My wife, it's hard to believe this, um, is one of the few remaining Americans that does not have and will not buy a smartphone. She has an old fashioned flip phone. So when she has to send a text, she has to go, you know, like, te- you know, press each thing three, four times, you know, to get to that letter. And she won't get one because I, it drives me crazy. Like, I can't, you know, she's like, can you do me a favor? Can you send a WhatsApp to someone? Because they only have WhatsApp. I'm um, in a Zoom class. And she, and she does that because she doesn't want it. She sees what it, what it does to me. She sees how addictive it is. She's like, I want no part of that. I'm not going to put myself in that situation. So, and it's getting tougher because they are moving us closer and closer to having to have a smartphone. There are, there are, there are times when I go to games now where I don't even know if they have hard tickets. Like there, there's no hard ticket anymore. You show your, your, you know, your, uh, your, you scan your, you know, your phone at the, uh, you know, at the check-in and flights now they're, they're, they're starting to move away. I haven't had a, a hard copy of boarding pass in ages. Um, my wife has to get one, you know, when she, when she travels away, just to go to the desk and get a, and get a hard copy of the boarding pass. So wish me luck. No, need, no, no luck necessary. <laughs> um, I, Are you thinking of right. doing that, Dan? Um, yeah, I've got, I've got a, I've got a book on a nightstand. I know. <laughs> but the other, the other thing is, I also like, I also have a. Um, you also have your phone have, charger on the nightstand too. <laughs> yeah, I also have a phone charger, but I also have like, I'm reading Dune on my on my phone on my uh, my on my on the kindle app on my phone mm-hmm. and so you know i you know i'm a, a friend of mine uh has made a commitment a number of years ago that he will read one hour every night right so he now so you know he burns through books right he right. he's he's uh, an avid reader so right yeah you know. It's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just stick to just stick to Dune and not some of his other stuff. You know the uh, the, the 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 religious you know offerings. No. Oh, okay. From Elrond. Right. Anybody else? Yeah, it's uh, it's Malka. I tried to subscribe. And I couldn't use the link that you gave. I just went to YouTube, found one of your uh, oh, okay. classes, and subscribed that way. So if anyone else has a problem, it's doable. Just go to um, YouTube. Yeah, let me see if the one, I, maybe I put in the wrong one. I put in the ohr.edu slash Harry slash subscribe. You, you um, put ODE, O-D-E. Yeah, O-H, O-H, did I spell it wrong in the chat? Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, I'm sorry, what is it? It's um. Hang on, let me try it again. It's uh, ohr. edu. What did I write? Oh yeah, you're right. I did. I did spell it wrong. I'm sorry. Ohr. Good thing somebody tried that. Thank you. You're welcome. Ohr. It's oh, get. You know, I see what's happening. My iPad is automatically correcting ohr into our. That's what happened. Ohr. edu. Slash Harry. Slash subscribe and you will get an email each week with the um oh okay that should be the correct one sorry about that thank you for pointing that out you're welcome any other questions all right thank you all for listening wishing you the um the best of luck um easy fast for those who are fasting on tish above 
and hoping that uh, someday soon, maybe even this year, turns from a, a day of tragedy into a, into a holiday. Be well. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. You're very Thanks. welcome. It was great. Take Thank care. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good night.